The Financial Services Committee held a hearing on Capitol Hill yesterday called the Digital Dollar Dilemma, the implications of a central bank digital currency and private sector alternatives. Some notable points from the hearing. Democratic Representative Stephen Lynch introduced the eCash Act to help safeguard electronic currency. I'm announcing and inviting my colleagues to join the Congressional Digital Dollar Caucus. This forum will educate members on critical issues relating to the development, design, and potential implementation of a government-issued digital dollar. I plan to invite innovators, technologists, academics, and other experts to share their findings and development. I hope my colleagues will join me in this exploration. I should make it clear that I do share the concerns with some of my colleagues about the need for digital currencies that respect privacy and anonymity. The use of anonymous cash has plummeted and more of our transactions are occurring online and under surveillance, tracked and aggregated by financial services companies. Indeed, China has turned that fact into a tool of full spectrum surveillance of its citizens. This is why I've introduced the eCash Act. This bill directs the Treasury to design and pilot a digital version of cash and would complement the Fed-issued CBDC. It would allow individuals to make instant peer-to-peer -peer payments with no consumer data or transaction tracking and without the use of a bank account. A central bank digital currency is a digital representation of fiat currency issued by a central bank using an electronic record to represent the fiat currency, in our case, the US dollar. Earlier this week, House Majority Whip Tom Emmer called the central bank digital currency a Chinese Communist Party style surveillance tool. Emmer introduced a bill against the CBDC at yesterday's hearing. Columbia Law Lecturer Raul Carrillo, who testified at yesterday's hearing and helped contribute to the eCash Act, joins us now to discuss the hearing. Thanks for coming on, Raul. Wonderful to be back, Jessica. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with this this concern that there's somehow more surveillance and this surveillance is malevolent when we have a digital currency. It's my understanding and it seems Lynch's understanding that we already have all kinds of consumer data collected by banks who control our transactions when we're transferring money through a digital interface, but also wherever we're purchasing things from, there's data collected uh, on the purchaser or purchasing side whenever you know we're purchasing something online or whenever we're using a credit card for a certain kind of payment. Is a digital dollar a way for the U.S. government to surveil our citizens? Thank you for asking the question. It really allows me to uh, break back into a mistaken assumption that I think undergirded yesterday's hearing. It's important to understand that today, yes, as you said, um, there's quite a bit of commercial data collection by banks, by credit reporting agencies, but even more so by um, data brokers, by fintech companies, by an entire new ecosystem that revolves increasingly around concentrated apps, which uh, collate and score our data in new ways. And the government uh, legally requires the private sector to share some of this data um, at particular points in time in a systematic fashion. At this point, it's almost automated. So when people say that the private sector affords privacy, that's not true because the government always stands in the back. In addition to the corporate surveillance, you necessarily have government surveillance because that's how mass surveillance works generally in this country post the Patriot Act. So they're being surveilled anyway, regardless of if you're making purchases with a private bank or you're using this kind of digital currency. Can you break down just a little bit? Uh, there's been some calls for some kind of private digital currency. To me, it sounds like they're referring to cryptocurrency, which has an entire, entirely different function than a fiat currency issued by a central bank or the US dollar. Can you just talk about why the eCash Act is important? Sure thing. Um, so to build off the earlier comment, I don't, um, I'm not suggesting that there's not a capacity to use a CBDC or digital fiat currency for panoptic surveillance. Indeed, that seems to be the direction in which we are heading. Um, but it is important, again, to compare to the existing baseline. Surveillance can be different, but this also presents an opportunity for us to actually build financial privacy and data security within a new system. The eCash Act is supposed to complement the idea that we will have public bank accounts and other sorts of instruments, and it provides the digital analog to paper cash. So we would use that device, um, perhaps a card as big as a credit card or a debit card or a secured environment on your phone 
to tap and pay for things as we do today, but without producing data. Um, you see the distinction here as being between, say, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. An eCash device would operate on a different network off the internet, so it wouldn't create the sort of data that the private sector creates or that potentially public bank accounts could create. So in that sense, it is a even small C conservative proposal to maintain privacy and civil rights within an inevitable process, which is the expansion of digital fiat currency around the globe. Was there discussion at this hearing as well about ways to potentially scale back this surveillance partnership, um, as you were explaining, between the government and these private companies in terms of online and digital transactions? Um, I, I think from a Republican or conservative perspective, there's been a lot of talk, for example, around the fact that the government is able to track gun owners and some credit card companies have even refused to work with gun manufacturers or allow gun purchases at this point. So on the private side, what are some of the policy changes potentially being raised? Right. So this is a, a good point, and I appreciate you raising it, because I see contradictions amongst um, anti-CBDC opponents who are anti-CBDC uh, uh, policymakers who suggest that um, it, it is the fault of the public sector for requiring reporting that is the problem here. But in fact, the private sector continues to collect rich and increasingly sophisticated and granular data, knowing full well that it is going to hand that information over to the government when necessary. And indeed, Silicon Valley increasingly partners with government agencies, the data brokers in particular, to make sure there is data sharing. So the suggestion that stablecoin companies or that new crypto companies are going to come in and save privacy or data security for people is quite flawed. And indeed, we see, I think, the stablecoin companies in particular as um, moving toward um, national security interests. Crypto is not a cool party anymore when it comes to privacy and surveillance. You've got spies, you've got cops, you've got venture capital. It is not uh, conducted in the spirit that it once was. And the idea that the blockchain or crypto will somehow provide privacy either on its own or embedded in a government system is frankly quite wrong in terms of reality and the law. So when we think about moving forward, I, a lot of people have kind of done away with cryptocurrency. There was a bit of a, a crash just a year ago that I think a lot of people realized if we can't have this kind of stable coin that we can easily transition from, OK, I have my my money in dollars. Now I'm going to transfer it to stable coins and then from there purchase my cryptocurrency, bitcoins and the like. When they proved that they couldn't offer stability with the stable coin, I think a lot of people pulled their money out of cryptocurrency, but we didn't see it really as the end of it. How would moving towards having more fintech or digital currency infrastructure, you know, bring people away from putting their dollars in cryptocurrency or looking for currency alternatives that are unstable and don't replace the function of a fiat currency? Yes, thank you. Financial stability is a very important point here, um, especially when we're talking about comparing the, um, the stable coins to potential digital fiat currency liabilities, whether those are CBDC or something else. Now, um, as you mentioned, crypto has crashed. Stable coins were at the center of that. An algorithmic stable coin uh, crashed um, leading up to the FTX bankruptcy and collapse. Of course, maybe the bigger problem is that uh, the stablecoin companies almost went down with Silicon Valley Bank, and they had their deposits um, in that bank, many of them uninsured. And if it hadn't been for the Fed, the largest stablecoin issuers, including Circle in particular, would have failed. So what this new technology and system offers is a chance for um, banks to have safe liabilities on their balance sheet provided by the Fed, and then to engage in credit and maturity transformation and do the things that banks do on the side. But we can make um, public support more explicit. We can stabilize banks in a way that would obviate, honestly, the need for stable coins, which are currently unsafe, precisely because they don't want to operate based on banking regulation. There's been some concern raised that a digital dollar could potentially be the first step towards extinction of the paper dollar, which would wipe out all uh, private transactions or truly private transactions, rather. Do you think that that's a realistic concern and something that might actually happen? So first of all, I support paper cash and um, across the board, 
the bans and municipalities are particularly troubling to me. Agreed. But I will say, if your concern is defending cash, uploading it into the 21st century in the form of e-cash does preserve cash's status as a monetary instrument that we've had for thousands of years. And moreover, if you're really concerned about the war on cash, you should be opposing fintech and crypto, which are the lead um, sort of companies against the usage of paper cash precisely because they want to collect data. Can we just get you to briefly explain, Raul, uh, the difference between having money in a uh, an account where you use a debit card to access it and using eCash? Sure, absolutely. So there are multiple forms of money that could deploy the digital dollar. Just as we use bank account money for some things today, um, we use you know perhaps Venmo for something else, paper cash for another thing. There can be an entire public fintech infrastructure that includes a variety of different monetary technologies for different purposes. So when you use a um, Bank of America card, for instance, the data is transferred within a relatively closed network of parties. Increasingly, um, when you use fintech apps, there are parties you don't know about involved in the transaction. There can be 13 parties that have access or share access to your data, and you don't necessarily know about that. Now, what um, a public bank account can do is certainly restrict the sharing of that data, but there is always going to be a sense that data generated can be abused. What eCash does is, again, try to create an analog to the paper cash where you pull out, where nobody needs to necessarily know about your transaction. It's an everyday thing. Maybe you have a good reason for wanting privacy, but everybody should just be able to make payments simply. And so eCash, instead of transferring over a network that is centralized or decentralized in the case of blockchain, it instead transfers the money locally through the hardware device to device or device to payment terminal, meaning that the data is never produced in a way that it can be abused. It's a sort of keep it off the cloud approach that is similar to a keep it in the ground approach in the climate justice movement. Thank you so much, Raul. This was incredibly informative. We appreciate you. More rising after this.